Hello and welcome to introduction to Elixir course on Edonix. My name is Ilya. In this lecture I would like to give you a very brief and general introduction to Erlang and Elixir because after all those two are very closely related, tied together. So let's just spend a couple of minutes talking about those languages, their origins and their main features. So, Erlang is a mature functional programming language that was initially introduced in 1986 by a company called Ericsson. So, that's a Swedish company that works with telecom systems and, well, the language itself was named by a mathematician called Egner Erlang, but, of course, you can see that the name Erlang also simply means Ericsson language. <laughs> so, that's like an acronym um, for those two words. Uh, so, initially this language was created by, uh, for the company's own needs, uh, because they were building telecom systems that needed to be performant, as performant as possible, as possible, uh, well, as scalable as possible, and of course fault tolerant, even in case of some natural disasters. Because after all, we uh, expect uh, telephone networks to operate under any circumstances, in any time, Time, in any day, etc., etc., and so the idea of Erlang revolves around the concept of high availability, about being performance scalable, etc., etc. And well, uh, this language is used by many popular companies, and for example, it's used by Heroku, which is cloud service provider. Also, it's used in WhatsApp. Uh, messaging application and, uh, for example, RabbitMQ, uh, well, that's uh, QN service, is also built with Erlang. Uh, so, as you see, it doesn't mean that Erlang can, all, can only be used to build uh, telecom systems. No, of course, uh, that's a general purpose language and, uh, well, it's used uh, quite extensively uh, these days. Uh, also, we can say that Erlang is a concurrency-oriented language. So, the main concurrency primitive is called a process. So, uh, it's not uh, the same as a system uh, process, of course. Well, the processes uh, that are created by operation system. No, it's a totally different process. Uh, those processes are thin, they are lightweight, and there can be thousands and thousands of processes uh, manipulated by Erlang at the same time. Uh, so, they can run simultaneously, they are isolated, which is very important as well, and so this means that they do not share any memory, and even if one of those processes crashes, all other processes uh, can continue to carry out their jobs, and also uh, we have special tools uh, and means to detect if a process if a process has crashed and we can do something about it, well, perhaps we can maybe reboot this process, restart this process. Uh, also, we need to know that Erlang runs on a special virtual machine. Uh, so, this virtual machine is called BEAM, which by basically means Bogdan Bjorn Erlang Abstract Machine. And so, with the help of special schedulers, uh, this virtual machine can distribute the uh, process's execution, basically. Uh, and processes themselves, uh, they communicate with asynchronous uh, messages. Uh, which means uh, there is no need uh, to, introduce, uh, to introduce concepts like locks or mutexes. So, as long as we are using async messages, uh, processes do not block the entire system. And moreover, each process has a very small execution time. So, basically, virtual machine uses schedulers and give, uh, gives each process its own execution window, execution time, and this execution window is very small, 
which means that even if we have some long running process, it is not going to occupy the system resources and uh, it's not going to block the whole system, which is very nice. Uh, so, well, as I said, we have a special virtual machine called BEAM and uh, basically Erlang code is compiled into special byte code that is being executed by this virtual machine. Uh, what's important is that Erlang is not just a uh, well, language to uh, code some applications, projects. It's like a whole a development platform that has many additional tools and features incorporated. It has lots of additional components and specifically we have access to a framework called Open Telecom Platform or simply OTP. Well, uh, despite uh, the name, it has nothing to do to building telecom systems. So that's just a multi-purpose framework that contains lots of various tools. Uh, for example, to build concurrent systems, to perform error detection, to recover from errors, to package the codes, to manage applications, etc., etc. So this framework is mostly um, cross-platform. It's open source, which is really cool. And we are going to take a look at this framework as well when I'm discussing our various Elixir features. On top of that, we have access to even more tools out of the box. So specifically, we can gain access to a special storage system called ETS and D. ETS. So ETS uh, means Erlang term storage and that's like an in-memory storage that may contain various Erlang terms. Uh, DETS is pretty much uh, the same as ETS but it stores all data on the disk. Uh, that's why there is this, this D letter. Uh, so we have access to those tools out of the box as well and it's quite simple to start working with them. And what's even more, Erlang provides even its own database management system called Mnesia. That's a NoSQL database and we can also utilize it to store some arbitrary data which is really, really cool and honestly I don't think there are that many languages that provide their own database management solution. Uh, so yeah, of course Mnesi is more complex than ETS or DETS, but still is, uh, it's quite convenient and you don't even need to introduce some third-party database management system. Uh, so now what about Elixir language? Well, uh, this language is very young because it emerged only in 2011 and uh, it was heavily influenced by Ruby language, which is, all, which is also quite popular these days. And Elixir also runs on Erlang virtual machine. So uh, um, it allows us to write more concise and more expressive code uh, in contrast to Erlang. Uh, but still, what's important, we have access to all Erlang goodies. So we have access to ETS, we have access to OTP, we have access to Mnesia, etc, etc, etc. So you may utilize all those tools while writing Elixir code. Uh, so basically we can say that Elixir is a more modern language because it provides some nice syntactic sugar. It allows us to write less code and be more expressive, which leads to more um, manageable projects. Because, I mean, Erlang is great and all that, but it's quite complex a language and it may be hard to perceive. And so Elixir in turn is simpler and it's more comfortable to work with. That's why it emerged. Uh, moreover, uh, Elixir has its own tools. It ships, for example, with a special tool called Mix that allows to easily create new projects, to manage dependencies, to compile code, etc. etc. And on top of that, there is even a special package manager for Elixir that is called Hex.
It is quite similar to, for example, npm that is used um, with JavaScript or to Ruby gems that is used with Ruby. And you may visit this website hex.pm and find many third-party libraries uh, here written by various people. What's more, there is even a web framework that is called Phoenix. It's also written in Elixir. Well, it's somewhat similar to Ruby on Rails or Django, but it is blazingly fast, so you can handle numerous clients. Uh, so you may be interested in learning Phoenix after you've dealt with Elixir. All right, of course, uh, Elixir and Erlang, they do have their downsides, like, well, every technology um, does. So, for example, uh, these languages are not very fast. Well, they are not definitely fastest in, fastest in the world. Uh, for example, C or C++ are much faster because they compile to machine code, whereas Erlang and Elixir work on a separate virtual machine called BEAM, as we've already learned, so they are slower. However, well, Erlang was never intended to be rocket fast. Uh, it was created to solve other problems, uh, and it revolves around scalability and concurrency, so that's by design, basically. Another downside, and probably the biggest downside, is that the general ecosystem and community is not that big comparing to, for example, a community of JavaScript or Python or Ruby, for example. So those languages are not that popular yet, hopefully, uh, which means that there are less resources on the net, there are less tutorials on the net, and of course there are less third-party solutions that you may utilize with your projects. Uh, because, for example, if you work with Ruby, there are countless of libraries available on the net, and you can find a library to solve any need that you can think of, starting from, I don't know, JSON parsing to complex CMSs and authentication solutions, etc., etc., etc. But unfortunately, that's not the case with Elixir which means you may end up in a situation where you have to spend some some time to solve a seemingly simple task. Uh, the last downside is the overall complexity of the language that can pose uh, some problems to newcomer developers. Because, of course, it does take time to understand functional programming and the specifics of the language. But, well, on the other hand, you are going to learn a new paradigm, uh, well, a new approach to programming, which is really, really great and can help, can help you grow as a specialist. Thank you.